Hi, I'm Tyra G., your host of Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Welcome again to our virtual global gathering of phenomenal listeners. Yeah, you. Fearsome and generous, humble and honest in pursuit of new possibilities and purpose. Every week, we meet for an hour to experience, educate, encourage, and empower each other. Yes, through our joy, our aha moments, and stories that have been left in our pockets for too long. We share topics that tradition tells us there are some things we just don't talk about, but not here. Here we live beyond the wreckage. Each week, we start right where we are. You're listening to Radio Fairfax, Fairfax, Virginia, on your TV, computer, or mobile device. And we are webcast worldwide on the Internet at www.radiofairfax.org every Saturday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Should you miss us? No worries. You can catch our podcast on YouTube on Frankly Speaking with Tyra G., And if you feel like connecting with me offline, we've been having some fun, haven't we? Just email me at Tyra at TyraGarlington.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you, Courtney Nero, for composing and performing our Frankly Speaking theme song. And for naming it, I'm Listening. Our theme this month is Thank You for Your Service, Then and Now. By now, you know I'm passionate about celebrating veterans and active duty military who continually help us sustain and maintain our quality of life, often at the greatest of cost. November and December, we've been hearing their stories through diverse lenses to include wars fought, age, gender, race, family impact, and especially cultural and social legacies. Our stories have included Mary Jessie Herrera, a 100-pound, 20-year-old military policewoman who wore as her accessories an M16 and a 9mm sidearm in Iraq. After being wounded in an ambush while taking prisoners to Fallujah, and 20 operations putting her arm back together. She's raising two lovely daughters and has a master's degree. George Bodie, an African-American officer in the Vietnam War who had to manage the social and cultural implications resulting from this being the first United States fully integrated war, which also saw the highest proportion of blacks ever to serve in an American war. We have heard heart-to-heart informative stories from women who decided to serve in the Vietnam War as nurses, librarians, and social support personnel, and some of the unusual consequences of their choices. We cried during stories and with the wives of prisoners of war and the military widows. Our last show featured Bill Shepard, pilot and commemorative Air Force Red Tail Squadron leader, and Vice President of Education of the Commemorative Air Force Red Tails, keeper of the history of the World War II Tuskegee Airmen. You may ask, well, who were they? On January 16, 1941, the War Department announced the creation of the 99th Pursuit Squadron. This was to be an all-black flying unit trained at the Tuskegee Institute founded in Tuskegee, Alabama by Booker T. Washington in 1881. It's fun to remember that First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was a huge fan of the Tuskegee Airmen and insisted on hitching a flying ride with one of the first pilots. She continued to keep in touch with some of them as friends over the year. Well, now this is our Christmas show. And after a break, I'm going to unwrap a gift a story about a very special veteran who touched all of our lives in one way or another, a hero, gracious and brave and honorable. Grab a snack, get comfortable, and stay close. 
This is Radio Fairfax, free-form programming created by the people for the people of Fairfax County, Virginia. Call us or email us, 703-560-TALK or radiofairfax at fcac.org. This is Ted Little inviting you to be with me this Monday at noon for Jukebox Noon Tunes. I'll play music from the 50s through today, as varied as Elvis and the Bare Naked Ladies. Highlights include news with a humorous twist, movies you may have missed, and a preview of your favorite Monday night TV programs. I want you to be with me Mondays at noon on Jukebox Noon Tunes. Hello, my name is Sharon Murray. I'm your host on Heartbeat, Thursdays at 12 noon. It's an inspirational program filled with messages of hope and love and a variety of heartwarming, inspirational music. You can succeed as long as success is in every beat of your heart. And I look forward to you joining me on Heartbeat, Thursdays at 12 noon on Radio Fairfax. An important message from Medicare. When my son first told me about extra help for Medicare, I said, thanks, but no thanks. I didn't want any help paying for my prescriptions. I told him, I don't have much money coming in, but I still have my pride. Besides, I, I looked into it a couple years ago. I figured if I didn't qualify then, I wouldn't qualify now either. My, oh my, am I ever glad my son didn't give up on me. He reminded me that I was on a limited income and that it was easier than ever for people like me to qualify. So, I called, and he was right. Now I pay just a few dollars for generics and a few dollars more for brand name prescriptions. With extra help, I can afford the prescriptions I need. Thanks, Medicare. Get the extra help you need to stay healthy. Visit socialsecurity.gov or call 1-800-772-1213. I'm Dr. Linda Van Eldick, a biomedical scientist supported by the American Health Assistance Foundation. I'm dedicated to educating the public because it's important for all of us to understand this debilitating disease. I conduct research aimed at discovering new and effective treatments for Alzheimer's disease. This is critical because every 70 seconds someone in America is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. That's more than a thousand people a day. Preliminary data show that exercise, a healthy diet, and keeping your mind active may help reduce your risk. At our website, ahaf.org, experts will answer your questions and address your concerns. Find out about promising research the Foundation funds and learn how to live with or care for someone with the disease. Call 1-800-437-2423 or go to ahaf.org for a free brochure on understanding Alzheimer's disease. That's 1-800-437-2423. I'm four years old, and I'm the only one in my whole class that can tie his own shoes. My mom took me to the circus for my birthday. Half my friends already went, but now I've gone too. Most kids make fun of me because I still believe in the tooth fairy. But I got five bucks yesterday. I believe. A third of the kids in my 8th grade class drink alcohol regularly. Over 99% of my class has been offered illegal drugs. Half of my college classmates binge drink, abuse drugs, or do both. But the frequent dinners I had with my family have helped make sure I'm not one of them. Go to casafamilyday.org, take the Family Day Pledge, and get tips on how to talk to your kids about drugs and alcohol. Have dinner with them often, and you can significantly lower their risk of substance abuse. Dinner makes a difference. A message from the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University. And we are back. I am looking at our first Christmas package, and the card says, A Veteran's Story. The Last World War II Commander-in-Chief by Pete Mecca. Six months shy of his 18th year, George Herbert Walker Bush was deemed a BMOC or a big man on campus at the Phillips Academy Boarding School 
in Andover, Massachusetts. He was born into affluence, his future unlimited, his father a managing partner in the country's largest private bank, Brown Brothers Harriman. Bush had already been accepted to continue his education at Yale University. His credentials were impeccable. By most standards, Bush was a sportsman and social animal, the playing manager of the basketball team, captain of soccer and baseball teams, deputy housemaster, the student council treasurer, and member of numerous other teams, boards, and clubs. He was 13th cousin, twice removed of the future Queen Elizabeth. The prestigious Walker Cup International Golf Competition was named after his grandfather. On December 7, 1941, as Bush was strolling across the campus at Phillips Academy, someone shouted that the Japanese airplanes had bombed Pearl Harbor. Bush no longer had it made. He decided then and there to discard his privileged world and join the Navy to avenge the attack on his country. He wanted to fly airplanes. Bush wanted to be a flyboy. Flyboy George Herbert Walker Bush would become America's 41st president. Yet, as the world remembers this man for his political career, America should also keep in mind he was a seasoned combat veteran of World War II and nearly lost his life in the waters off a remote island in the middle of nowhere called Shishijima. This is his wartime story. Before being shot down on September 2nd, 1944, Bush had flown into combat for about five months. He dodged anti-aircraft fire over Wake Island, Saipan, Guam, and Marcus Island. Bush sunk ships and had to ditch once. In all, he would fly 58 strikes, log 1,228 hours, and make 126 carrier landings. At 20 years of age, Bush was the youngest pilot in his squadron. He'd lost friends, seen buddies go down in flames, yet allowed his comrade tell Ted White to replace the tail gunner. On his TBM Avenger on that fateful day, Bush's target that day was Shishijima, about 150 miles north of Iwo Jima. The island served as a small naval base with a few sub-chasers, gunboats, and minesweepers. About 3,800 Japanese Army and Navy personnel called Shishijima home. However, the main importance of the island was the two long-range radio stations, both well-protected with anti-aircraft guns and ringed with reinforced concrete. Shishijima was a painful thorn in the side of the U.S. Navy. September 2nd, 1944, at 0715, Bush lifts his torpedo plane off the deck of the San Jacinto with his gunner, Ted White, and radio man John Delaney on board. As the American planes wing their way toward Shishijima, Enemy radar operators spot blips on their screen of incoming American aircraft. They are ready to meet the Americans. At 0815, Bush's squadron begins their bomb runs. The tall radio antenna poking at the sky from the radio stations were easy to spot. The lead plane and the second plane complete their runs. But by now, the enemy gunners have the proper range and are eagerly awaiting the third American warplane, Bush's Avenger. As Bush marks it 
to the release altitude and is set to drop four or 500 pound bombs on the target, a shell rips through the aircraft. The following quotes by George Bush are paraphrased excerpts from James Bradley's book, Flyboys. And I quote, there was a fierce jolt and it lifted the plane forward. We were probably falling at a speed of 190 miles per hour. Smoke was coming out from the engine and I couldn't see the controls. I saw flames running along the wings toward the fuel tank. I thought, oh, this is really bad. But I was thinking also what I was supposed to do and what I was expected to do was to drop those bombs and haul ass out of there. The Avenger was on fire and trailing thick smoke. Yet the 20-year-old kid at the controls stayed the course, released four bombs on target, and turned east to clear Shishijima as the Avenger rapidly lost altitude. Bush yelled into the intercom to White and Delaney, hit the silk, hit the silk. He slipped his aircraft into a position that made it easier for the two crew members to bail out. Yet the maneuver made his own emergency exit more difficult. Plus, it created the loss of precious time. Bush said, I unfastened my seatbelt, then jumped out and down to avoid the tail. But I pulled the cord too quickly and the tail came up and hit me in the head. I had a big bleeding gash above my eye, which was bad enough. But then the parachute hooked on the tail and tore a few panels out. As a result, I was falling a lot faster than normal. I could see the island. I started paddling with my hands, leaning over the front of the raft, paddling as hard as I could. A Portuguese man of war stung my arm and it hurt. I had gulped a few pints of seawater when I landed and I was vomiting. My head was bleeding. I was wondering about my crewmen. I was crying. I was 20 years old and traumatized. I had survived a burning plane crash. I was all alone and wondering if I'd make it. I had seen the notorious photo of the Australian pilot being beheaded and I knew how Americans were treated on Bataan. Yes, I had a few things on my mind. I saw this dot emerge from the water about a hundred yards away. Then the dot grew larger. First, a periscope. Then the conning tower. Then the hull of a submarine emerged from the depths. I thought it was delirious. But when I decided it was a submarine all right, I feared it might be a Japanese sub. It just seemed too lucky and too far-fetched that it would be an American submarine. It was indeed an American submarine, the USS Finback. The submariners tossed Bush a line and pulled him alongside. As they helped the bleeding, soaking wet and exhausted flyboard aboard, the future president of the United States only managed to say four words to his rescuers. Happy to be aboard. Bush spent a month on the USS Spinback before it being returned to his ship. He helped rescue other downed flyboys and often stood the midnight to 0400 watch while the Finback was surfaced. He recalled those four hours of reflective time in Bradley's book to be repeated here word for word. I'll never forget the beauty of the Pacific, the flying fish, the stark wonder of the sea, the waves breaking across the bow. It was absolutely dark in the middle of the Pacific. The nights were so clear and the stars so brilliant. It was wonderful and energizing. A time to talk to God. I had time to reflect, to go deep inside myself and search for answers. People talk about a kind of foxhole Christianity where you're in trouble and think you're going to die and so you want to make everything right with God and everybody else right there in the last minute. But this was just the opposite of that. I had already faced death 
and God had spared me. I had this very deep and profound gratitude and a sense of wonder. Sometimes when there is a disaster, people will pray, why me? In an opposite way, I had the same question. Why had I been spared? And what did God have in store for me? One of the things I realized out there all alone was how much family meant to me. However, facing death and being given another chance to live, I could see just how important these values and principles were that my parents had instilled in me. And of course, how much I love Barbara, the girl I knew I would marry. As you know and grow older and try to retrace the steps that made you the person that you are, the signposts to look for are those special times of insight. I remember my days and nights aboard the Finback as one of those times, maybe the most important of them all. In my own view, there's got to be some kind of destiny and I was being spared for something on earth. This was our 41st president, George Herbert Walker Bush, in the swamp-filled trenches of Washington, D.C. He and his lovely wife, Barbara, stood above the sordid politics so America could stand tall. He was our last commander-in-chief who served in World War II. It is doubtful this country will ever see the likes of the greatest generation or the character of his presidency to s again. Pete Mecca, the author, is also a Vietnam veteran. It's not too late to say thank you for your service, George Herbert Walker Bush. I have another Christmas package that I hope will bring smiles to all of you who served and are of a certain age. You stay close now. And we are back. I had such fun discovering the next Christmas package. I was doing some research and I wanted to make sure since we were getting close to the end of our celebration of veterans and active military and I ran across this particular gift and it's called well let me let me back up do you know that there was a time that if you had loved ones overseas you couldn't FaceTime or post good news and happy thoughts for your loved ones via multiple social media platforms yep there were in those days the next gift we will open will be delivered the only way possible in the 1940s. You can imagine George Herbert Walker Bush may have listened to this special Air Force Christmas package delivered as a radio show while he was on the USS Finback submarine. I invite you to walk back into history with me now. Hi, you guys and gals everywhere, and Merry Christmas to you. This is Linda Darnell, filling in for Santa Claus and getting ready to untie a ribbon on a great big package of entertainment addressed to each and every one of you and March, do not open till Christmas. It's chock full of greetings and word and song from some of your favorite entertainers with a special message from the Chief of Chaplains for the Army and for the Navy. Right now, gang, let's tear off the gift wrapping and see what's inside. make some room here, because right at the top of your Christmas box are the Andrews sisters, here to send their very best Christmas greetings. 
And how are they going to do that? Well, of course, they're going to sing. solid as the andiron old St. Nick leans his bag on when he brushes the cinders out of his beard after coming down the chimney. Well, you know, fellas, Christmas calls for a lot of things. Good fellowship, hospitality, and fun. But for a moment, with the finer implications of Christmas, we go to our nation's capital, Washington, where you will hear a special Christmas message from the Navy's chief of chaplains, Captain Robert D. Workman. Go ahead, Washington, and Captain Workman. The chaplains of the Navy Department join with others here in Washington in sending special, individual Christmas greetings to you, the men and women of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. This Christmas, our thought turns first to you. We know full well that your thoughts are of home and your loved ones. We wish to assure you that the people here at home who appreciate the reasons why we are in this war, realize that you are putting your all into this scrap because you are anxious, among other things, that the spirit of Christmas and the right to enjoy a good old-fashioned Christmas shall be preserved through the years which lie ahead. The spirit of Christmas is the Christ. Christ was the gift of God who sent his Son that we might know the way, the truth, and the light, and possess the secret of attaining eternal life. Christ's own life was the perfect example of doing things for others and giving for others. We show the true spirit of Christmas, therefore, when we do for others and give for others. You out there, each of you, wherever you are today, is a living example of this spirit. You are giving loyal, devoted service to your country, and you give it as though you were giving it personally for your loved ones 
and for your good neighbor around the corner. For this gift from you this Christmas, the hearts of Americans well up with gratitude and pride. Speaking for them, I say, thank you, soldier. Thank you, Blue Jacket. Thank you, Marine. Thank you, Coast Guard. And what of our gift? What will be our gift to our country at a time like this? What will be our gift to you? With humility, we offer to our country increased devotion, which we hope will be worthy, in some small measure, to be compared with your noble gift to our beloved land. And for you individually, we offer as a gift a prayer of gratitude for your gift and a prayer that you may be kept safe and be returned home to enjoy with your loved ones and friends many, many Merry Christmases through the years to come. God bless you and grant you the richest and most precious blessing of the Christmas season. Thank you, Captain Workman. And now, gang, back to your Christmas package because we've lots of unwrapping to do. Say, here's an item I'm sure you'll say looks mighty fine all decked out in cellophane and holiday tinsel because she's a favorite item of yours all the year through. And a swell gal she is, Jenny Sims. Thank you, Linda. Gee, I'm thrilled to be on this Christmas program for all you fighting men. And I want to add my Yuletide greetings to each and every one of you. Maybe I'm too big to fit in your stocking, but I hope this song fits your holiday mood. Claus for tonight, the man who's been trying to get me on his lap all afternoon to whisper what I want for Christmas, Bob Hope. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. How do you do, fellas? This is Bob wishing a Merry Christmas to all you United Nations servicemen everywhere, Hope. Speaking for the Americans, the Chinese, the English, and the Rus, saying that as soon as we fry our Christmas turkey, we'll finish cooking Hitler's goose. Well, it's not a big lab. It's just an opening. But anyway, <laughs> soldiers everywhere love Christmas because during the holidays, the commanding officers choose certain guys and grant them furloughs. Choose certain guys and grant them furloughs. That's an army expression meaning eeny, meeny, miny, there ain't no mole. <laughs> and this Christmas, 
Christmas, we really got men all over. We got men in more places than Crosby and I built roads to. <laughs> They're even hanging mistletoe up there in the Aleutians. And you know the Eskimo system of kissing with the noses? I don't mind playing post office, but brother, that's the wrong zone. <laughs> it's so cold up there, one soldier on Kiska wanted a certain type of sweater for Christmas, but they couldn't get Lana Turner past the postal authorities. <laughs> and the fellows in the Aleutians really have a lot of unusual weather. I'm not allowed to mention what kind of weather it is, but all I can say is if we had that weather in California, it would freeze almost as many oranges as the weather we have does. <laughs> in London is something, too. They got a black out there all the time. One private grabbed someone under the mistletoe, and everything was all right until he reached around and felt three chevrons. <laughs> England is pretty similar to us when it comes to celebrating Christmas, except for that warm beer. That beer is really warm. After two quarts, you can save your burps and rent yourself out as a flamethrower. <laughs> area who had an interesting Christmas. He got a card from Dorothy Lamour with a picture of her in a sarong on it. What a picture. You know how George Washington looked straight ahead on the two-cent stamp? Well, on this envelope, he kept peeking over his shoulder. <laughs> and in Italy, the soldiers couldn't get any tinsel for their Christmas tree, so they decided to decorate the tree with spaghetti. When they put in the plug, the meatballs lit up. <laughs> One company over in India had a Christmas dinner. They ran short of turkey, but nothing stops those GIs. They just started slicing the white meat off the Colonel's eagle. Oh, and Christmas... <laughs> Christmas in a lot of places is pretty strange. In Africa, you should see Santa Claus fly through the air on a sleigh pulled by six camels. <laughs> Boy, those camels. A soldier can't get off them. In order to dismount, you have to go over the hill. <laughs> And the difference in seasons is really amusing. Christmas time here is cold, and over in the South Sea Islands, it's time for planting. All day long, you can see those girls in the grass skirts rotating their crops. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right about that. And over on one South Sea Island, the hula girls played Santa Claus. Instead of their grass skirts, they just wore long white beards. It's the first time a bunch of soldiers were ever in favor of G.I. haircuts for all. <laughs> Thank you, Bob Hope. That was swell. And now, men, with a big red ribbon round her waist and a sprig of holly in her hair, meet the girl whose fan mail is stupendous and whose voice is the same. Lena Horn, singing... Honeysuckle Rose. Every honeybee sighs with jealousy when they see you out with me. I don't blame them, goodness knows. Honeysuckle Rose. Oh, when we're passing by, flowers droop and sigh. And I know the reason why you must see the goodness knows. Oh, no. 
A lot of Christmas greetings mixed in with the packages we've unwrapped, and now we're happy to return once again to Washington, where General Arnold, Chief of Army Chaplains, is standing by with a warm word of greeting for each and every one of you. Go ahead, Washington, and General Arnold. Millions of men the world over are gathered around their chaplains in camps, hospitals, and battle areas to hear again the story of the first Christmas. Thousands of others in isolated places will open their little volume of the scriptures to read for themselves St. Matthew's and St. Luke's account of our Savior's birth in Bethlehem. Men far from their homes and their loved ones will find comfort in meditating upon the hardships and sufferings of the Holy Family. They will see more clearly the real meaning of Christmas and feel more deeply the comfort of God's goodness in sending his son to live with us and for us. In times of peace and security, we often used our many blessings rather frivolously. Our merriment frequently became revelry. Extravagance and lack of appreciation were more evident than reverence and gratitude. We thought more of our ease and pleasure than of God's goodness and mercy. Many a Christmas came and went without making us better men and women. Now, however, we see Christmas as men of faith and courage saw it 2,000 years ago. The hardships and sufferings of war have cleansed our hearts of pride and vanity, and we have a truer knowledge of the things which really count in life. Prayer and trust in God have a new value for us. Home and the daily association with loved ones are now appreciated as never before. Honest labor, leisure for simple pleasures, and peace with moderate plenty would fill our hearts with real joy. Through the coming of God's Son to share and sweeten our life, we know that we can be happy and joyful despite pain, hardship, and material losses. These are the simple truths which Christmas has been trying to teach us for 20 centuries. Joseph and Mary and Christ himself suffered much to assure us of happiness if we have faith and love and courage. With glowing hearts, therefore, we hear the angel's message. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, for this day is born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Bravely and hopefully, we look up to the star of Bethlehem and add our voices to the song of the heavenly host, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to men of goodwill. Thank you, General Arnold. Once again, gang, back to your Christmas package. And the little digging through the cellophane hereabouts brings up a small item, but potent. It's a round-trip ticket to Wistful Vista, the home of Fibber McGee and Molly. And something tells me we're going to get down there just in time to find Fibber arguing with a little girl who lives down the street. Give me a box of cigars for Christmas because I only want... Hey, what goes on here? What are you two whispering about? She says I better go home, Mister. Huh? She says you're mad at me because I want to have the kids sing a Christmas carol for you. Oh, now, I ain't mad exactly, sis. I'll I bet just... you you are, I'll bet you. Oh, and gee, the kids have been out there in that pool all afternoon on account of that... Now, 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 none of that, sis. Now, cut it out. The only reason I didn't want them to sing is... Give us kids. The night before Christmas, 
and gee, we rehearsed it like 60. Are you ready, Tia? Yeah, I'm ready, sir. No, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, Molly. Madam Gee. Here. Take my money and my watch. You know me. Every time I hear these things, I want to give away everything I own. <laughs>
St. Nicholas won't come again for a year. The children are nestled all warm in their wee little beds. While memories of sugar plums dance in their wee little McGee and Molly. Well, fellas, I guess we've opened the last parcel in the Christmas package. Seems like the only thing left to do is to read the card that came along with it. It's just about the biggest Christmas card you ever saw, and it has millions of signatures on it. It's signed by every mother and father and sister and brother and wife and sweetheart here at home. And it says, A Merry Christmas to you, and may God speed you to victory. Seventy-four years ago, seventy-four years ago, thank you for your service, veterans and active military everywhere. Let's fast forward to the present. I was wondering, I don't know if you've ever wondered, but as we come to the close of the end of our two-month celebration of the bravery, honor, and commitment of our veterans and active military. Do you ever wonder about the counterintuitiveness of war as a critical success factor for establishing and maintaining peace? And what about personal peace? What about personal peace? One of the most sought after human, emotional, and spiritual conditions Do you know what you need to discover and sustain your personal state of peace? I've heard people say things like, I'll be at peace or I will know peace when I choose or when I learn to forgive myself. I will know peace when I reclaim all of the pieces of myself. I will know peace when I allow myself to trust my vulnerabilities. I will know peace when I realize I'm not alone. I will know peace when I accept things are the way things need to be. I wanna park on that last phrase. When I accept things are the way they need to be and deposit the following in our Christmas takeaway spiritual doggy bag. Stop trying to be perfect. Stop it. Right now. Stop trying to fix yourself. Change yourself. Perfect yourself. Stop trying to do everything just so. Stop trying to improve every little thing so that everything about you will be perfect. Stop trying to impress people with how perfect you are. Stop making up stories about how perfect your life is. Stop looking for little imperfections so that you can perfect them. The quest for perfection is a waste of time and energy. It's the quest that closes your mind and your heart to the beauty around you. You can be so preoccupied perfecting the cracks that you forget that life comes through the cracks. Remember the words of our famous author, Ernest Hemingway, who said, not everything that appears to be broken needs to be fixed. In fact, some of us are strong through the broken places. In other words, everything need not be perfect to be divine. That includes you. Embrace the cracks in your life 
and breaks in your heart and places into which the divine light can shine. You've been listening to Frankly Speaking with Tyra G on www.radiofairfax.org. Your seat at the table is guaranteed every Saturday night. Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night.